Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Asia Edit Author Success Webinar. I'm Trevor Lane, an education consultant at Asia Edit. And for more than 25 years, I've trained thousands of researchers worldwide to publish and promote their research, including by writing news, news articles. So in this webinar, I'll be helping you to convert your research articles into to writing that general audiences can understand. Now, this is important because in uh, research careers now, it's gone beyond just research articles and you have to promote and publicize your work yourself as well. Now, this webinar follows an earlier introductory webinar on how to effectively communicate and promote your research. So uh, do check that out on the Asia Edit website afterwards. Now, in this hour, we'll be looking specifically at non-academic writing to convert your research articles into news. And we'll be covering plain language principles, keeping non-academic audiences engaged, and my top tips for converting research findings into news for the wider community. And the final 10 minutes will be reserved for a Q&A question and answer session, where I'll be happy to answer your questions and please do type them in the question box. But during this webinar, uh, please raise your virtual hand when I ask you live questions, or you can chat and put the type your answers live into the chat box. But then for the Q&A session, please type your questions in the question box so they don't scroll up and disappear. So let's begin with the right language to use, because as I said, you have to go beyond research articles, uh, but it's a different type of English. So let's look at these plain English language principles. You're going to have to translate from English into English. So here's a quick uh, task to begin with. Can you type in the chat box? See if you can translate these. Actually, they have the same answer, but they're different versions. So there's A, and then there's B, and then there's C. So type in the chat box if you can translate them from these complicated versions into simple everyday language that the public can understand. And we'll go through them and we'll give you some hints. So not A, that's not a good one because there's long words, maybe old fashioned words, felicitations bestowed on you. And also passive voice uh, bestowed on you and the time during which you were delivered into this world. Okay, someone's got it. Well done. Uh, how about B? So can you translate it into something more simple? B is complicated because there's all these negatives, there's double negatives. I don't wish you to retract. So that means I want you to accept. And then there's opposed to sadness. So that must be happiness. And not forgetting is remembering, then opposite of night, opposite of death. Mm. And C is the same thing, but again, it's a complicated version. Uh, as we can see, it's very, very long. And there are lots of empty phrases, like it goes without saying, uh, without beating around the bush or beating about the bush. And then there's embedding, except if you please. So if you see these pairs of commas, with parenthetical or extra information inside, that's embedding, uh, too much detail. So it's TMI, too much information. Uh, we have annual commemoration of the day on which you were born. So there's weird definitions here, but then we've added extra definitions. Celebration of uh, giving and receiving of presents and a cake bearing ignited candles in the quantity equivalent to your chronological age. Mm. So I think there's enough clues there. So someone got it right. Uh, so they all should translate into something simple, actually just two words. And the message here is kiss to keep it short and simple. So these complicated versions are simply just happy birthday. So well done, those who got it right. So what is plain language? We have to translate from English to English and there are some guidelines, but actually we'll see from today's webinar, it's a little bit trickier than we think. There are no real guidelines. So in the US, actually in 2010, Barack Obama made it a law for federal uh, departments 
in the US, whenever they give public notices, they have to use plain language or plain writing or plain English. And it's so your audience can understand the first time they read or hear it. In the UK in the 1970s, they tried to start a campaign called the Plain English Campaign. And they define it as having the reader in mind with the right tone of voice that's clear and concise. And then there's international movements trying to push for plain language, but specifically for kind of uh, government notices whenever the public is involved. It's uh, the wording structure and design that are clear so the intended audience can easily find what they need, understand what they find and use that information. Now in the dictionary, the Collins Dictionary has a simpler definition that says it's language that's clear and easy to understand with no ambiguity or unnecessarily difficult words. Now in the US, their main dictionary is the Merriam-Webster. I think someone was uh, has a sense of humor when they defined it. They say plain language is unconcealed by any cryptographic process. So not hidden, so clear, clear language. Now notice it doesn't say for the public, for the, for, uh, consumers. So actually plain language just means clear and simple. And there are four C's. Can you type in the chat box? What, what are the four C's do you think we can summarize what we just read about how so far plain English is defined? I'll give you some hints here. So it matches the context and purpose and audience. We assume non-specialist audience, but it doesn't have to be. It's simple but not, and not misleading or ambiguous, but it still has to be factually and grammatically accurate. It's relatable, respectful and empathic. So you're, you have the reader in mind, the audience in mind, you know their knowledge level, so how technical you should uh, make your language uh, and what their level of English is. You should know their expectations, their culture, the tone of voice that they're used to. And it's got to sound friendly and unbiased and not create barriers because you want to help them but also predict what they will have um, as questions or problems because you want them to easily read understand navigate use remember and recall your words so that it's it has a it's effective you achieve your aim and you can get them to do something so governments or banks insurance companies they want the consumer to do something, pay something, but we want to change behavior, increase awareness, increase knowledge levels, education. So you want something to happen in the reader. So you have to make your words effective and understandable. Yes, someone's written clear. So the C's are, the first one is congruous, which is harmonious. So you have to use suitable, appropriate language that matches the audience. Clear, concise, and correct. So don't oversimplify so much that it becomes inaccurate and scientifically wrong. So next we have a look at specialist English because we said plain English doesn't have to be just the public. So academics could use the same principles to write clearer papers, but not to make it so simple that it sounds weird. So for example, there is specialist language that either in specialist English or for public English, it doesn't make sense to try to use synonyms and change. For example, if you're writing something all about photosynthesis, it would be odd, especially in academic writing to change it to say, oh, this is how plants and other organisms use the sunlight to make food or use light energy to combine with CO2 and water to make sugar. If you say that every single time, it's a bit weird. So you do have to use some specialist terms. So plain language doesn't mean removing all specialist terms. Specialist jargon maybe is a bit more informal and is only known within groups. And then specialist slang, of course, you shouldn't really use even in academic writing. So the more informal and in-group the language is, then the more exclusive it is and you're shutting people out. So of course, then if you want to include more people, then you remove the slang, remove the jargon, but you, you'll still have to keep some of those specialist terms. So for example, actually in academic language and journal papers, people um, laugh and say, oh, it's called academies. It's a language of its own. You will see things like this, but actually it has a very specific meaning for the group of people who will read and understand it. If you try to rewrite it and you'll, you'll make, change the meaning and then make it sound silly 
or it actually becomes three times the amount of text because you're having to explain every single term. There's officialies or bureaucraties for government departments writing notices for the public or demanding taxes. There's legalese in contracts and laws. We often see words like this, but there's a reason for it because the lawyers don't want to have the words exclude or include something they don't want to. So it's got to be quite specific. And then for business uh, and commerce, we hear things like this, and even for guidelines for medical operations, we'll see things like this, but it is normal for that group. So the point about plain English is you can expand the audience and, and explain more and simplify if you want other people to understand it, but it doesn't mean change everything into public level government language. So specialist English is specialist English. Plain English then is something different. And it means writing for the public for the plain English campaign is very specific in the UK in the 70s onwards. They want to write like they talk. So you'll use language with second person like I, uh, first and second person, I and you, and you'll have contractions like can't and don't, and you'll have direct imperatives, commands like do this, do that, pay this, pay on time. So you'll agree, actually, in academic writing will never have this type of language in it, even if you're trying to write in plain language. And in news, if it's academic news, but for the general audience, again, you, you wouldn't have direct commands or I or you or contractions depending on the publication. So the words plain English, plain language have a very specific meaning if it's in a government department. So here's an example. For example, paying by check, make your check payable too. So you'll see there's bullet points and then there's contractions. Don't fold your check or fasten it to any notes or papers you are sending in the same envelope. So very clear language and direct. And we, we wouldn't use that language even if we're writing research news. Then there's a simplified technical English that uh, the aerospace industry uses. They don't want people to misunderstand instructions. So words that have more than one meaning, they try to reduce it and control the vocabulary. So it aids translation, it reduces ambiguity. So they want 20 to 25 words per sentence, very clear active voice, clear instructions, because they don't want people to assemble the thing in the wrong way. Uh, it's not like IKEA furniture. So they have to have very specific words. Uh, now, we might think it's quite plain already and easy because engine oil contains toxic chemicals. Don't allow it to contact, contact your skin for prolonged periods. But actually for simplified technical English, STE, they have to say engine oil is poisonous. You must not let it touch your skin. So you can see the difference there. And that would be very weird also to write in that language if we're writing research news. There's also controlled English that the uh, aeroplanes and staff and air traffic control use. We've seen it on, on TV, on um, programs about planes. So aviation English, Roger means received. Wilco, I will comply. Instead of ABC, they say Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Instead of the number nine, they say Nina, because nine might sound like five. And then you can't say I, you can't say you. So very controlled language. Then for learners, there's another type of language which is very reduced and basic with only 850 words, uh, something called Ogden's list. And similarly, the Oxford 3000, 5000 or academic list are the, um, the most used words that uh, learners should be able to learn and get by with. And finally, a movement started in Australia. Um, easy English is for people with learning issues and, and learning difficulties. So the sentences should only be 10 words long with lots of pictures, everything is simplified. Again, we won't be using that type of language. So actually none of these match what plain language is for academics converting their work into news. So uh, put your hand up if you think this is a good example of public plain English it's meant to be seen, people driving should see this quickly. Is it a good example? No, I don't think so. So there's a separation between the subject and verb. No person sh shall, and we have to go to line four, drive, and then it's the vehicles longer than 10.5 meters. And then it's a lot of embedding, 
uh, Friday, Saturday. Now this is Sunday before a public holiday or an actual public holiday. So this is not very good, uh, this sign, and it's meant to be read quickly by drivers. And you'll remember the webinar we did on conference presentation and preparing material. This is like the, the poster session. So don't do your posters like this. Now, this is a good example of a public poster. So the CDC, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, their COVID poster. Now, before we saw the road sign was all in capital letters, which is difficult to read. Here, they've only put the title as capitals because we say capitals are like shouting. But here, the CDC want to shout, don't delay, test soon and treat early. So for public notices using this government plain English, they want to write in a talking style, have logical organization, so the purpose, the problem solution and action is very clear, and then the contact details at the bottom. They use short sentences because it reduces reading effort. We don't want people to remember a lot. The working memory, short term memory is quite limited. And easy to follow grammar, everyday words, short words, and they use active voice, first and second person. You might have to define the reader in uh, public notices and letters. For example, it you could be talking about you, the parent, in one paragraph, and then you, the student, in another paragraph, or you, the patient. So you might have to define the you. And when uh, you give instructions, you often turn it into question and then you don't use you, even if it's the reader, you use I. So how do I pay? How do I do this? How do I return the library books? So you turn it into a question with the I, not the you. You don't say, how do you pay? Because then it sounds like you're demanding payment. So this is something quite peculiar with plain English um, for things like for action items and letters and things like that. So you and I refer to the reader, but we refers to the sender. Then, as I said, you're allowed contractions, but not complicated contractions like wouldn't have, uh, standing for would not have. And I've noticed they don't use your for you are, maybe because it uh, can get confused with your possessive you. And direct instructions, must do this, should do this. So must is for obligation and should is for recommendation. And then you can use pictures and easy to read visuals and bullet points and graphics and icons and left aligned spacing you'll notice in that poster. And then for online material too, there are guidelines to have lots of white space, shorter paragraphs and for clear links, don't just say click here, you have to say what it is. So read the full report, for example, and then you can click. And then for pictures and photos, you have to have alt text for accessibility. So you describe what the picture is if you don't already have a caption and you have a very descriptive uh, alt text with fewer than 125 characters. So I've made this list from what I found on uh, for guidelines on plain writing for what I think are plain writing principles for academic conversion of your research into news because we don't really want to unless you are doing posters for the public, you don't want to write um, and prepare work that we just saw in that public poster. So be congruous, I said, so test out your drafts with your audience and be polite and helpful and use short everyday words without jargon or slang. But you, you will have to use technical words, but you just define them and define your abbreviations and be direct and concrete with personal pronouns, contractions and imperatives, if it's allowed. So usually it's not allowed in news or journal genres. Be clear, so keep the subject, verb and object together, not like the road sign where the subject and verb were separated with lots of embedding. Prefer active verbs and present tense. Uh, use verbs, not nouns, we'll see that in a minute. Clarify it. So here it says the X was in the Y and then it, but it could be X or Y. So you, you'll have to define and say the X if you mean the X or the Y if you mean the Y. And clarify modifiers. I only drink water means you only drink it. You don't eat it. So you actually mean I drink only water. Be concise, so read it out to test if you have very long sentences or very short choppy sentences. So the guidelines usually are fewer than 20 words per sentence with just one main idea and fewer than seven lines per paragraph with one main topic per paragraph. And delete redundant terms. 
be correct. So use proper grammar, spelling, punctuation, and don't oversimplify or mislead with your facts. Use the same accuracy, precision, certainty, frequency, quantities, and scope as your research article as the source. So provide complete and unbiased information, and then increase readability with white space, write in chunks, don't have very long sentences, and then keep terms consistent. So if you say teenagers, don't later on say teens or youths or adolescents, because they'll have slightly different definitions and then you've changed what the topic is. So I know some people might not be used to this, they've been told to use synonyms, but actually it's better to keep the same term throughout. Now there are readability indexes like the flesh reading, flesh Kincaid, and also fog, but actually, it's a little bit uh, misleading because just having short sentences and short words and counting the words is not going to be enough. As I said, we might have to have technical words and there's no point just having very short words and sentences and having uh, weird constructions. You'll end up having the cat sat on the mat and the fish swim in the sea types of sentences all the way through, which doesn't suit the audience. And then use design features and bullet points if you're allowed to. So some journals or some news um, places don't let you use bullet points. So let's move on to how to keep the reader engaged and not confusing them. So if you make them reread anything, they'll give up. So how do you keep the reader interested and not confused or annoyed? So put your hand up if you think these can be improved. So here's the first sentence. Before consumption of drink by mouth, people raise glass, clink glass, and cheers is said. Yes, it can be improved because um, this is very long. We have consumption of drink by mouth. That just means drinking. So don't overcomplicate it. And then we have a list of raising your glass and clinking your glass, and but then it's changed to passive. Um, cheers is said. So keep lists parallel and keep bullet point lists parallel. So here's a better version. Before drinking, so consumption of drink by mouth, before drinking, people raise glasses, clink them together and say cheers. So we have verb, 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 everything is parallel. But hang on, this is not right either because before drinking people, it sounds like you're drinking people and then you, what you have to do, you have to say cheers when you're drinking people. This is like the uh, let's eat grandma sentence. So let's eat grandma or let's eat comma grandma. So here we need a comma after before drinking. Here's another example. Can we improve this? My students were inspired by their parents, Superman and Wonder Woman. So this is another list. So this is to show the logic of lists is very important and can easily go wrong. So here actually, because there's one comma, it sounds like the parents are being defined and renamed as Superman and Wonder Woman. Um, so this is the, a positive comma, you're renaming the people. So actually it's a total of four people, the two parents, Superman and Wonder Woman, so we need the final comma. So this is the serial comma, S-E-R-I-A-L, not cornflake serial, uh, or the Oxford comma. So we do need it sometimes, but however, in this example, we have commas after each term. Uh, the interviewee said she was lucky to meet her grandmother, comma, Princess Diana, comma, and Prince Charles. Uh, but in this case, because there's a pair of commas, it's still the a positive comma. It sounds like you're defining the grandmother and renaming her as Princess Diana. So sometimes serial Oxford commas don't work either. So the Princess Diana wasn't her grandmother. So here we remove the final comma and just say grandmother, Princess Diana and Prince Charles. Or you'll have to recast it and say the grandmother as well as Princess Diana, Princess Diana and Prince Charles, or in addition to Princess Diana and Prince Charles. And then um, the she said it could refer to Princess Diana or the mother or the interviewee that's female. So again, you have to rename uh, pronouns and say the interviewee said. So to not confuse the reader and make them give up, we need to delete unneeded words, keep everything simple and concise. So in this case, redundancy, reanalyzing something already implies 
you're going to retrieve it and reanalyze again. So we don't need all these extra words. So just re reanalyzed X. Um, assessment is required, is already compulsory. So we don't need to say compulsory. Um, words that are already understood. So here, unique is already an absolute term. You can't have more or less unique or extremely or very unique. So unique samples were blue and spherical. You don't have to say in color or in shape. And then plans are always future. History is always past. So just say the plan was to exit the stage by jumping off it. In talking, we add lots of empty phrases. So here, um, just say the movie was entertaining or my current workload is heavy. And similarly, there's lots of introductory phrases in speaking where we buy time to get some thinking time. So you don't say things or you don't write this when you're writing for the public. And um, what I'd like to throw into the pot is my two cents worth, maybe in social media, casual talking only. So just go ahead and say what you're going to say. And then repeated terms and abbreviations, make sure you know, for example, syndrome is the S of AIDS and number is the N in PIN. So don't double up on some of the terms by accident. Simplify when possible. So turn most passives into actives. So X has been discovered by them, turns into they discovered X. So it's more direct and fewer words. But sometimes you don't want to name the doer you don't want to blame and maybe you don't know who did it so sometimes you have to use the passive any mistakes that were found were quickly corrected recast indirect or abstract phrases or noun strings where you have a long row of words before the noun at the end people will forget again from the short-term memory they'll forget what what you were saying before that noun so remove wordiness so here instead of do not use x unless in the event that that could be rewritten as if, but the rest is still too long. So instead of all that, about the same temperature which the air of the room is at, just say use X at room temperature, not all the conditions to not use X. Release hidden verbs, so don't trap your verbs in nouns. So instead of performed in com a comparison, just say they compared. So nouns like uh, ending in munt or shun or jun, watch out for those, because you'll end up having some weak, empty verbs like make, do, have, take, or perform, conduct, you'll end up having extra verbs and making everything longer. Rewrite slang, jargon, and cliches. So instead of how do you prep for the exam to pass with flying colors, again, turn it into the I if it's a question for instructions for the public. How do I prepare for the examination? You, you could use exam depending on the, the genre. And then shorten words and rewrite double negatives and try to avoid it or there, but there are times when you will have to use it or there. So instead of it was apparent, there were no methodologies utilized for analysis purposes that had not been previously published, just say we used published analytical methods. So methodologies can usually become methods, utilized can usually become used. So beware of longer words when you have a shorter alternative. Now, there are some things to remember when you're writing your messages to help the reader stay focused and understand your message, because they expect the topic to, be, to come before the comment. So sentences normally have two halves, the beginning and end. So the introduction is the topic, the ending is the comment. So the topic is like the thing you're going to talk about. Kind of when you're talking, you say, oh, do you know the program last night? So you name what the topic is, and then you're going to talk about the program. So the topic, for example, here is the sentence topic. So in this example, the sentence topic goes first in the sentence before the comment. So the sentence topic is the topic. If you put the topic at the end, people will forget what you're saying. So going first in a sentence before the comment is the topic. So people will have to double take and reread the sentence again. So topic be before the comment. Also, old information goes before new information. So this is true. The topic sentence normally starts a paragraph. So give a summary or conclusion sentence actually at the beginning. That's the topic sentence. Now, that's always going to be something new. 
but then the next sentence use old before new. So refer back to that topic sentence. Here we've put that sentence is then followed by the supporting sentences. So that's an example of old referring to the first sentence and then having a comment about it. If we said the support then follows it, we don't know what it refers to. And also we have new information about support, which is too sudden. We want to talk about old information first, which was that first sentence about the topic sentence. Or you then provide the support for it. Again, you'll confuse the reader. So put old before new. Also put short before long. So the subject is a very short noun here, should not be too far away from its verb. We saw that before. So the subject should not be too far away from its verb. If we put lots of embedding, the subject to avoid causing reader confusion and to help with reading comprehension should not be too far away from its verb, then we've separated the subject and verb. The, the subject is too far away from should and you've confused the reader. So the things to remember are topic before comment, old before new and short before long. You can also add transitional signal phrase phrases at the beginning. So to help the audience add introductory phrases to sentences, then readers will be able to follow your message more easily. And then for the whole text, put the main news first, just like the topic sentence, but it's a special one. In news writing, the first topic sentence of the whole text should be the main news, conclusion, or key message. Don't make people wait for the conclusion at the end. Don't surprise them. Even if you've got bad news to tell them, it's best to tell it first. So here's an example, though, of plain language writing, which isn't news and is not a government poster. It's actually a plain language abstract or plain language summary, PLS. Now, you might have seen this in some journals that are starting to do it. But if you have a look, it's still kind of based on an abstract. So they'll have a technical abstract and then the plain language abstract below it. It could be on the same page printed or online in the PDF. It could be uh, taken out and put on the table of contents so people read the plain language version and then the theory is they click and they're more likely to click onto the article but uh, so you can use wh questions they've reorganized the abstract into uh, what do we know why was this study needed what was done what was found what does this mean or in this example there's three wh questions or it could be uh, IMRAD style, but IMRAC, introduction, methods, results, and conclusion. So conclusion rather than discussion. And it could be just one paragraph, um, a narrative abstract, or it could be itemized with sections, introduction, methods, results, conclusion. But you'll see either the WH bullet point version or the IMRAC abstract version, the text version, it's still basically the same as the abstract with synonyms. Uh, because, for example, acute kidney injury AKI, biochemical criteria, prospective study, incidence, severity, outcomes, the public won't understand those words. You'll, you'd need to explain a lot first. So even though it's simpler and it's so-called plain language, it's plainer language, but it's actually for academics, for researchers, so just non-specialists. Now this version is written for the public and it's called a lay summary. So whenever we, we see general lay summary, then it's for the public. And so some journals are doing this. So this is unclear because some journals just say plain language, but they mean for other researchers or for graduates, or they might specifically say for the public. So before that was in plus medicine um, and it was called plain language summary this one is e-life and it's called a digest but actually it's a plain language but it's a lay summary so it could be one paragraph based on imrac again it could be bullet points it could just be a few sentences so it could be a long summary or, or a short summary but it's written in public language or it could be wh questions or in this case they've rewritten it to have a different title from the research article it says germ cells in the dish they've added explanatory paragraphs at the beginning and then they reach the rewritten paraphrased version of the imrac abstract and they refer to themselves in the third person they don't say we they say joe et al 
So they're trying to make it look more like news. And then there will be a uh, ending implications. They'll have an extra paragraph to try to make it more interesting and relevant to the public. And they might even add an, another simplified illustration so it looks like an infographic. So this is a lay version, but very few journals are doing this. So be careful, read the instructions for authors, look at some past examples to see what they mean and learn how to do it. But then we might think this is still a bit weird. It's not really for the public because um, it tries to add some information at the beginning, but then it just sounds like a textbook. Then they throw in the paraphrased abstract in the middle, which might be too technical still, and then they add some implications at the end. So here, for example, they're trying to explain what primordial germ cells are, but you might have to explain eggs and sperm from the beginning to the public. Or, for example, the uh, so-called simplified title, germ cells in the dish, the public might not know that germ cells mean the precursors of egg and sperm. They might be thinking of, because of COVID, microbes, microorganisms, germs, bacteria, viruses. So we've used, we've actually confused them by using a simplified word, which is not the right one. So be careful of writing for the public. Because you have to know how to do it. Some journals are asking for it, but then you, you will have to disseminate your research to the public. So this is a quick explanation, history lesson um, res for researchers. Publish or perish, you've heard of, so you have to publish something, but you can actually publish and perish if you've written something wrong by accident, misinformation, or you've actually spread fake news on purpose, disinformation or you've done your research unethically, or you've published something in, a, in an unethical way, or you've chosen a predatory journal by accident. So check the checklist on Think, Check, Submit. If you've published in a journal that sounds like a famous one, but they tricked you and they used a website which is the wrong website, and you paid them and you published there, then you've lost your paper, unfortunately, so you've published and you'll perish. So be careful, check the journal's uh, venue that you're submitting to. Then maybe 20 years ago, it's published and flourish. So you're trying to publish, but make people read your work and cite your work so that you get more um, career advancement from it. So choose open access journals, get more people to read it and cite it, promote your work at conferences, uh, debate your work in blogs and social media, clarify, um, publish a correction if you found a mistake. So be honest and correct your work so it's so it's still um, trustworthy and credible. So this this is all to do with responsibility, but advancing your career. But it's still a bit selfish, so it's, it's, so it's still a bit um, old-fashioned, not quite right. So nowadays, United Nations, UNESCO, you might have heard of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, it's more responsible as a researcher to publish and nourish. So you're not thinking about yourself and flourishing in your career, you're nourishing the society, you're nourishing your field, your discipline, and you're trying to make your publication do extra work and actually get mobilized and used in the real world. So this is knowledge exchange, open research, open data, share your data and have societal impact, not just journal impact or citations. So try to aim for publish and nourish so that you're helping society, this, which means you have to translate your work for stakeholders. So translate from scientific English into non-scientific English, summarize, adapt, identify your stakeholders, engage with them, uh, take part in seminars and events for the public. You might have heard of the three minute thesis, 3MT, or uh, Pint of Science. We had an Asia edit podcast with the Pint of Science that you can check out. So this is converting your work into a public everyday language description for the public to understand. You could do video abstracts, a lightning talk, again, just three minutes to talk about your work with a non-technical script or the Pecha Kucha automatically timed 20 slides, 20 seconds, but again, with a general public language script or infographics, podcasts, things like that for the public. And in this case, you start to, with a hook, with something interesting to get them interested. So you could start with an interesting fact or statistic or a paradox or contradiction, a question, or say, imagine something so that you're getting them to think, um, or a quotation. And then you build on that and layer your story for the public. 
So actually, after publication, so notice it says post-publication, so we want you to peer have your work peer-reviewed and accepted in a journal before you promote it. Then you convert it into non-technical English. As we've seen, it could be a plain language summary, either for other academics or for the public. And here, um, it could be for patients, for your funder. And clinical trials in the US and Europe, you have to submit your trial online before you do your uh, trial. But then after it, you have to submit a lay language version of the summary of the results as well. Um, so it could be an abstract version, it could be a summary version. It's got to be unbiased and, and also ethical, not commercial, no conflicts of interest. Uh, give the trial number if you've registered your trial and always link it to your article. Similarly for social media posts, link it to your article. It, this could be prepared by the journal or your university, but it might not be allowed for industry papers because it's, it counts as direct to patient marketing in most countries. Uh, but be ready for answering comments on social media. Similarly for news releases and blogs, for example, um, there could be a press release done by your university or the journal, otherwise you have to write it yourself. It could be for a news platform or a blog or website. And again, be prepared that uh, journalists might read it and interview you. And you could add a, a simple illustration. Don't just repeat one of the article figures because there might be copyright involved and the public won't understand it. So you need a simplified illustration there. Even for the grant funder, you have to use lay language for your next grant proposal. So in the abstract, especially, the panelists may not be specialists, so they'll need a everyday language version. And then even when you finished a project and published it, most funders want a general language summary for the public as well. And then for, for example, government policies, you want to help shape local or national policy, you could uh, issue an advocacy brief, which is specific advice based on your research, or an objective brief, which is more like a review with uh, a choice of different recommendations. So this is again mobilizing your research work into the society. So finally, we'll talk about turning your findings into actually news articles. We saw new style, plain language summaries or plain language abstracts, which may or may not work for the public. But then this version, actually actual press releases are aimed for the public. So put your hand up if you think these are in plain English. Uh, so A, uh, number one, I can tell you is not plain English because um, we, Dr. A, B and C, based at the University of X, published something. That's not really the news and it's very long winded. And so I see this a lot in university news uh, that you publish the paper is not the news. So try to pick out what is the main point, the most important point. And here we have lots of noun strings. So a new efficient window glass surface coat cleaning system. So the cleaning system is the noun you want, but there's too much going on before it. Number two is also not a good news sentence because it's vague. Uh, you must manufactured something. Again, is that really news? And the window cleaned itself. Does that mean um, it, it used soap and water by itself? And we've repeated a lot of things, cleaning itself on its own, autonomous, automatic, without human intervention, all repeat the same thing. Number three is too magazine-y, miracle dirt proof glass coating so you don't have to clean your windows ever again so this is not um you're not writing for supermarket sales so be careful and again we made something is not news itself and miracle that does sound too promotional and saying you don't it depends on the publication the genre whether you're allowed to say you whether you can have contractions and then the dirt proof glass coating we don't know whether the coating is to coat glass or whether it is a sheet of glass which is another coating so be careful of noun strings so actually the number four is a good one so this is plain english and a good direct news item and notice we use the present perfect we don't use simple past so we have invented a dirt proof coating for glass that reduces the need for cleaning so it's not ambiguous it's a coating for glass it's dirt proof 
and it's not it doesn't really clean itself with soap and water and we have invented something and the invention still exists and is useful and is relevant to today so there's a relevance to the present so we use the present perfect and um it shows it, it implies we've just done it even though you did it maybe two years ago it sounds like you you just did it so we have invented so how do you translate your findings into something newsworthy so Limit it to 500 words, although you, it could go longer if it's a news feature, but don't just copy the, the title of your paper. Find the key point, the most important point, and a story angle. So don't just think, oh, we've created a theory that does something. Try to create, um, to spell out what the implication is, what the benefit is. So it might be theoretical and, and groundbreaking for you but the public won't really understand so turn it into something practical and interesting and timely explain technical terms in reverse so cancer spread or metastasis or you use an author quote so don't sound like a dictionary so the author can be saying it oh metastasis means cancer spreading or if your paper is about a specific term you can use the technical term and say photosynthesis throughout the paper but then define it um, in brackets or with a pair of commas what photosynthesis is the first time explain the significance objectively so again you'll be writing about your own paper but in the third person he she they so it sounds objective so give quotations from your group or from you but you're saying it as if you're saying it indirectly and use evidence so don't don't treat it like a, an abstract and finally link it to your peer-reviewed source so for general audiences, use short and direct language, beware of cultural differences and using jokes and idioms. So piece of cake means easy or goat means greatest of all time, but not everybody knows that. Use clear analogies, so prefer analogies to metaphors. So a, a dung beetle rolling its dung is equivalent to a human carrying 16 elephants because it's a thousand times body weight. Uh, Diatoms are small single cell algae, which are a quarter of the width of a human hair. So use things that people can relate to, but not things like the virus is very hungry or the virus is happy or sad. So don't make it too simple and, and childlike. Avoid phrasal verbs because it's diff difficult to get the real meaning of, even if, though it's shorter words, um, the adverbs and, pro and prepositions change the meaning of the verb. And then use a and bias language, so staff instead of workmen or manpower, patients with diabetes instead of diabetics. And you can say said or say throughout, but try to add your the degree of certainty and your and the stance. For example, in reporting verbs, the neutral is state, but it could be negative, questioned, challenged, objected, or denied, or it could be positive, speculated, hypothesized, confirmed. So just like a lift speech, elevator pitch, uh, when you introduce yourself, give a greeting, who you help and what you help them with, and then how you help them. So if you do meet somebody and you're talking to the public live, then say something like, hello, I'm X from the University of Y. Our team helps parents teach their children lifelong soft skills by providing them online apps. And then say what your achievement is your news item say it early at the beginning and say it clearly early and clearly so don't just repeat the title of your paper and turn it into something that's an achievement or a solution or a benefit and use the present tense and beware of unintended meanings such as the brain research unit gets new head so say director or manager so not mobile app to support parent assisted science news literacy education in domestic settings but a new mobile app helps parents teach kids to spot fake science news now when you write the news there's two types one is the hard and breaking news so it's urgent it's important so this is the type you want to write and the importance is the opposite to an abstract of a journal article which goes from least to most important as you work towards the conclusion to show the evidence and you try to argue for the conclusion so in hard news you put the most important first so actually it's completely opposite it's an inverted pyramid the conclusion goes first followed by some details and then any background 
not really the methods, not really the whole history of it. So if you cut from the bottom, the olden days in newspapers, you could cut and remove from the bottom and you still get the news. So cut away, cut away, you still get that top one. The top we say that is the lead, the middle part is the body, and the bottom part is the tail. So you can remove the tail, you can remove the body, and you'll still have the lead, the most important part of the news. So begin the headline in present tense, give the immediate release or give the date if it's embargoed. Some journals won't let you uh, publicize your work until the actual paper is published. So the most important goes first in the lead sentence or paragraph. So answer the WH questions, what, who, where, when, what's the most important, use present tense or present perfect, have discovered. Then the middle part, the body, you elaborate and support with some data, simplified data, or a quote from one of your uh, research group members. And that adds some, a human element. And remember, you use your quotes to give extra definitions or the implications. It shouldn't come from you as the author because it sounds subjective. Finally, the ending should have a bit of uh, background, but not really the methods, unless the methods is a key part of the, the story. And then try to end with a quotation and implications. So our discovery adds to global efforts and illustrates our university's commitment. So it's okay to have um, promotional uh, sentences about your uh, the reputation of your university. It's uh, expected. The journalist might delete it, but you can say it because it's part of your promotional efforts. End the press release with three hashes or three X's or end or ends or three zero. These are just the weird conventions to end the press release. And then you can give a glossary of terms to define things or a paragraph about your institution and most importantly, contact details and link it to your research paper. Now, you can submit your work to uh, press release services like Eureka Alert, Arthur Galileo, and Cision PR Newswire. You'll have to pay for those services, but they'll help you promote your press release. Or you can target specific journalists. There's also soft news where you add a bit more flavor. So there's salt and pepper. Because it's not urgent news, maybe it's more human interest or emotional. So you have to pad it out a bit. So soft news is like the salt shaker. You begin with something like, like a hook, like one of those sentences for the public. So when was the last time you did this? So notice that the hard news doesn't use you or we or I, unless it's inside the quotation. But soft news and features, you can use first and second pronouns. Uh, then the then main news is called the delayed lead, usually with a now. So you state the problem, you introduce it with a teaser, and then you say, now the researchers have done something. So this is where the lead would have been in hard news. And then you end with a kicker to try to make it memorable. So action item, go and get your teeth checked, go and recycle more. Or a feature is like this, much longer. So maybe longer than 500 words, and you can help the reader understand it with subheadings. And it will begin with some bait on the hook. But remember, don't, don't have headlines and first paragraphs, which are too promotional. We don't want clickbait. But say something with a story, like Mr. X wants to be the first 100-year-old to do something. Then the hook comes next. And then the delayed lead with an explanation of what the news is. So this is called the nut graph or the nutshell paragraph. So this is where the actual news item is. And then the ending ends with a conclusion. And normally it loops back to the beginning to talk about Mr. X again and to have an action item or something interesting as a quotation. So this is, these are some, some tips for soft news. Now, some examples are this one from the BBC. So he's gone, murmurs the zoo vet. This is a soft news and it's going to be a news feature. This one, Rosalind Franklin would have been totally amazed that 100 years after her birth, she's being commemorated. This is soft news. It's actually about an event, but they've made the event sound more interesting and human. If they just said event held in Cambridge, it would be a very boring new piece of news. So, it, and it's not really urgent hard news. So they've made it soft news. So C, 
is an example of hard news. More than 80 cases of monkeypox have been, present perfect, confirmed in at least 12 countries. The WHO has said another 50 cases are being investigated. So notice the patterns, try to use them in your news writing. But don't leave people up garden paths, either in your news story where they don't know the direction of what you're saying. You're, you're layering installment by installment, but the, the public doesn't know where you're going. Or even in sentences, be careful. So in your sentence, be careful of looking dull, we repainted the walls. It sounds like the we are looking dull. Or for quotations where someone said, you need to brush your teeth twice daily, you have to change that to indirect speech. So you becomes they, the need becomes past tense needed, unless you're giving something, a general instruction uh, that people need to brush their teeth. Be careful of top heavy sentences, people forget what you're saying till the end. Something, something, something is important. So turn it around and use it. It is important that something, something. Be careful of lists. So to enter university, preschool, primary and high school, that sounds like a list, but actually it isn't. You have to say to improve their chances of entering university, comma, pupils at preschool, primary school and high school are learning to code. So it wasn't a list. Be careful of non-restrictive or restrictive relative clauses. So the mice, comma, which had received drug A, comma, were larger. That means all of the mice had received drug A. If you don't have commas, only some of the mice received drug A. Or team leader, Dr. X said, um, you don't need that comma because the team leader sounds, it's part of the title, team leader, Dr. X. Otherwise, you need to rewrite to say the team leader, comma, Dr. X, or Dr. X, comma, the team leader. Don't simplify too much, especially with that. So journalists like to delete all the that's. So somebody said that, they just say somebody said. But be careful because he reported last year the rate was low. You don't know whether last year is the reporting time or that last year the rate was low. So you have to put the that back in. There's some other examples there. And then relative clauses, forms submitted, sounds like the forms are doing something, but actually it's short for forms that had been submitted. Here, they made children salad for 10 years. Sounds like you're making salad out of children. And here, X didn't continue because of the cost. You need to put a comma for the reason why you didn't continue. If you don't have the comma, it sounds like you did continue, but X didn't continue because of the cost, but it continued for another reason. And finally, some tips for writing news. Be ethical, don't mislead, don't use words like miracle cure. Be careful of relative versus absolute terms and mixing opinion with fact. Declare your funding source and conflicts of interest and check uh, copyright of any material you used. Cite the sources that you use and what strength of evidence it is and what study type it is. And is it humans or animals? Use plain English, but choose the right type. As we saw, it can vary from informal and public to quite formal and still for other scientists. Be helpful and interesting. Here we have a comma, be helpful and interesting. So in journalism, in the headline, they'll just put comma rather than and. So be helpful and interesting. Use subheadings, keep subject verb object together. Uh, use logical sequences, give examples, and always edit and proof your work carefully. Watch your tenses present in the headline and present perfect in the actual news item. And then if you pitch your story to journalists, then you choose your journalist specifically and email them with a tailored, customized email. Remember, what's in it for them? They want to know why they should publish your story. Don't make it obvious that you're just sending it to 100 journalists. So argue and frame uh, why your news is news. And then remember, pitch, P-I-T-C-H, uh, emphasize the proximity, impact, timeliness, conflict, and human interest value of your news. Don't just give the academic part of why your news is important. So we do have a few minutes for questions now. So please type your questions in the question box. I uh, hope you found this information useful have, and get some tips for writing your news and converting it into public language. So we've looked at uh, plain English for general audiences, how to engage the audiences to make it interesting, and uh, the structure of news articles. So please type your questions and I'll try to answer them. So uh, 
Is the headline always in present tense? No, it doesn't have to be. It can be past tense if you actually discovered something about the past. So if it's new insight about something that's happened, um, something caused something, the volcano, something, um, something worsened something, it can still be past tense. Um, how much data to put into a news story. Uh, you can round up and round down, you can simplify the data. Now, if you're writing for a general audience and submitting your work to something like Eureka Alert, so you know scientists will be reading, you can put more detail, so give the average, um, but you'll say something like, oh, it, it, it doubled, but then you give the actual number in brackets. Um, so and 95% confidence intervals, p-values. You can put extra details in the data in the brackets. The people who care will read the data. They, if the journalists pick up your story, they'll rewrite it and they'll, they'll remove the, the details of the data and they'll use the rounded up version. Um, can you publicize your preprints? So preprints are not peer reviewed and it's where people put their drafts online, but actually the thing, the international norm in universities and for journals and uh, science communicators is you, you should not promote your peer, your preprints because they haven't been pre, peer reviewed and you shouldn't uh, promote them to the media. Now, there might have been exceptions because of COVID, but you really do have to explain to the journalist if they found your preprint, you have to explain it's not been peer reviewed, it's preliminary, it hasn't um, been confirmed, the conclusion might change. But otherwise, you shouldn't actively promote preprints or conference posters and abstracts. That's the norm these days. You don't want to um, the, the public to treat preliminary news as if it's peer-reviewed journal articles, especially if the work is rejected and deleted later on so you, or withdrawn. Um, so don't promote your preprints. One more question. Um, do we have to always repeat keywords? So if, if there's a specific, specific term, I said like teenagers, then don't change it to teen or adolescent. But you can use synonym if, you, if you're finding that it's getting too repetitive, but choose a close, uh, accurate synonym. So a group word, uh, for example, um, if you're talking about the spike protein of the COVID virus, then you can, instead of saying spike protein, spike protein, you can refer to it as the molecule, the surface structure, the surface feature, the protein. So you can use different words, but keep it accurate. But usually prefer the, the specific technical term. It's okay to repeat that. And finally, for approaching journalists, you, you can find specific journalist contact details online for the newspapers you want to target, whether it's an online or print newspaper, or in social media, most journalists, if, if it's TV journalists, newspaper journalists, they are online on Twitter. So you can you can reach them by social media, but find out about that journalist and see what they've tweeted about in the past so that you can add to their story. So there's a reason that you're targeting that specific journalist. Okay, we've reached the end now of our hour together. So I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar and a recording and a link to the handout will be made available by the um, Asia Edit team. And there are more free resources and educational materials on the asiaedit.com website. So email us if you have ideas for further webinars or if you have questions that we didn't answer today. I hope you found this webinar useful. And until next time, I wish you success and goodbye and stay safe.